You're on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is still my studio, but it's a different corner of it. And it's where I paint. Um, I have a very fancy wooden easel, which is all singing or dancing. And I bought it about 20 years ago for about 600 pounds. But mostly I use ladders and G cramps. They, I use them for everything. And I probably have well, seven or eight in my studio at any given time. This is um, the basic tools. A G cramp. Clamp. Clamp. <laughs> a G clamp. And step ladder. And the step ladders cost, I don't know, 15 or 20 quid. And there's a G cramps. G clamps. <laughs> About two pounds. They're immensely practical. I use them for everything. And it converts a ladder into an easel in seconds or into a light stand or camera stand. So I've primed a big six foot by four foot canvas and I've started to prime this. So today I'm going to just put another coat on that and because there's not much I can do uh, until the canvases are finished being primed, which won't be until tonight, early morning, I'm going to work on two of the hand finished prints to show how those evolve. So first, I'm just going to put another coat on this. This is probably going to be the canvas I'm going to do the painting on. But it still might be the big one. I haven't made up my mind yet. And I put, I don't know, five or six, four or five coats on this with a roller. Because what I'm basically doing is... losing the grid of the canvas. Now, I'm using a foam roller. I don't usually. I usually use a fur one, which I prefer. But the one I was just about to use is broken, and I didn't find a new one. This is um, Dale Rowney Primer. Um, I don't use, I use um, golden paints mostly, but mostly I use the Daily Rowney primer because it's incredibly unobtrusive and this is what I want from a primer. It doesn't noticeably interact with the paints. You're out of shot while you're making that noise. <laughs> well, great big. I can confirm it's paint. <laughs> yeah, terrible. Okay, great. Have you experimented at all with digital painting tools? I have the question here. Um, no, why would I? <laughs> I, I? I did work on a big project with Hank Rogers, the, the Black Onyx project back in... Um, uh, well, we started in 94 and continued through to 96. And the project manager pretty much was insistent that we used, did everything digitally. And at that, back then at least, it might have changed now, the experience of drawing on one of those boards was really frustrating. I could finish the drawing, slip back, have a cup of tea and then watch it appear. It was that um, related to what I actually did and I, I just didn't want to bother and I remember at the end of the project I collected a great watch of drawings which I loved and the, um, Michael Kaluta who was working on this with me he was doing the characters we both had this great watch of drawings 
And he said, if you two had worked digitally, you wouldn't have had to bother with that. And I'm thinking, this isn't trouble. This isn't waste product. This is what we do. Anyway, no. Um, with the graphics sometimes, yeah. I work with people who know better how to do, use the tools than me. But um, I don't think I'm going to bother learning to paint with digitally because at the end of the day I wouldn't have a painting. And that's, for me, half the joy of it. The thing is, um, art is about objects. It's not really abstract in the same way music or literature is. And the making of the object, and it is an object, this is an object, you can feel it, you can walk around it, you can walk into it and get covered in paint. It's here, it's real. It's part of the process. Art is about artifacts, it's about things. And it's about, I don't know if you want to be philosophical, it's about expanding consciousness and insight through things you make. Uh, and it's, for me, it's a joyous process and I wouldn't want to not do it. So I have one thing. Lots of people are asking questions and someone asked if we could not do questions and just let Dad paint for a bit. So as a compromise, <laughs> what I think we're going to do is maybe just have a question time specifically uh, from, shall we say, what do, what do you think, Dad? Um, well, to be honest, unless it's irritating, I don't mind answering questions. I mean, if I was here working on my own, no one around, I'd be listening to um, a story, an uh, audio disc of some kind probably, the radio. I wouldn't work in silence very often. So listening to the questions and thinking about it, for me it's not a distraction in the sense of it interfering with the work. It's a distraction in a very important sense that it takes my thinking mind away and lets me work much more intuitively. So, yeah, I'm up for the questions, but either way, I'm afraid you're not going to want to watch white paint dry. <laughs> so, for the moment at least, um, give me a couple of questions and Freya and I are going to swap places and I'm going to work on something else while this dries. Someone asked, have we collaborated? You could answer that. Very shaking her head, but actually we have. We did it in front of a camera, which you can look at when we did a joint show in Tokyo. Or didn't that count? Uh, yes, yes. And we both worked on the um, Edgar project. Fred did costumes, I did sets. So that was good, because we weren't working on the same piece of paper, but we have in fact done that, worked on the same piece of paper, or canvas. Okay, you ready to swap places? Um, yep. Have a look at that. There you go. Sorry everyone, this is going to be a little bit wobbly for a second. And then we go here. Can you tell me if this is the right angle, Dad? Yeah, okay. So you're not going to film all the paint. Oh, you want to <laughs> do that? Yeah. Okay. Philip Russell Lacey wants to know if you ever use watercolours. Can I you do, pass yeah. me that stool as well? I, um, I use watercolours a lot. Um, and the thing about watercolours is it's not an easy thing to do. It's very unforgiving of mistakes. And 
to get vivid colors used to be a real problem. And I say used to be because there's a range, range of watercolor paints out there now, which are brilliant for color saturation. There's two things about watercolor that makes a saturated color. And that's grinding the pigment super fine. And there was a maker of watercolor paints called Old Holland. And that was their basic plain thing. They ground and reground and reground the pigment till it was super fine. And it made for a much more intense color. But there's another way of making an intense color and that's swishing the gum arabic base for honey. Now, people have joked about that. Don't paint in the open air with that because you'll attract the wasps and the bees. But it's, it does produce a very vivid color. And I do enjoy working. And you can use, and I've got primer that you can put on canvas so that you can work with a watercolor paint on canvas. And that was interesting. I haven't done it much, but I have tried it and it's interesting. So what I have here is a, um, a print for close to the edge. And this is a hand finished print. And I'm asked often what makes a hand finished print a hand finished print. So there's two ways I do it. In the case of this one, um, I add things. I add trees and I've added, I added a temple in here. I've added features in there and in the sky. But mostly I add trees because I like the idea of more trees in this. The paper it's printed on is a very heavy 630, 638 GSM watercolour paper. Now I have been asked to paint on prints before and it's a nightmare because the paper that we do printing on is not the same as which we paint on. The watercolour paint uh, paper is incredibly robust and I can paint on it and it won't buckle, and it will, it just holds its form and it reflects the paint brilliantly. So it's a pleasure to work on this. This is a large print. Um, I'll get another one to show you the size of the slightly smaller ones. This is another one I'm going to work on. And this is Pathways. And with Pathways, I'm not adding features. I'm simply making the foreground colors much more intense. Okay. Questions? Do you want me to show, show you a question? Yeah. Um, so a practical one. Um, Danny Paterno, sorry if I'm pronouncing these badly, um, wants to know how he could get in touch with you about a cover. How would someone do that? Um, I get any emails that go to the that are addressed to me that go to the website. So, um, yeah, um, RogerDean.com, info at RogerDean.com. Do any of the members of Yes own original pieces of your work? Um, Steve Howe owns his second album cover, but um, not, it's not a normal procedure. I've sold astonishingly few pieces to musicians. <laughs> so someone mentioned they'd like it if the name if I read out the name as well as the question, and um, the problem that I have is if the question's quite long, the name kind of disappears. So if you want me to say your name, if you could try and make sure to keep your question quite short, then I can definitely fit it in. Um, but Patty Shea, again, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, asks if you stretch the paper. Do you have a stretch paper? I, all my original works from the 60s and 70s 
were on stretch paper. That's what we were taught to do at our school. And I did stretch paper and it's a very oh, laborious process. Stretching paper and stretching canvas are both things I'm very pleased not to be doing anymore. And the reason I don't need to stretch paper for watercolours is this. It's a very heavyweight, brilliant watercolour paper. And I've even soaked it with water and watercolour paint. And it does curl, but it doesn't buckle all over the place. It's easy to keep it flat afterwards. So it's um, it saved that rather laborious process of um, stretching paper. And sometimes it goes wrong. So um, in the case of stretching paper, when I've worked on um, stretch paper, which are prints, it's, it's kind of expensive when it goes wrong. And it does, it goes wrong. Um, I've... Um, Yeah, a few years ago, I don't know how many, but um, maybe 10 years ago, I was stretching canvases all the time. And it would take me a week to prepare maybe three or four canvases. Hard work and not necessarily always satisfying. I mean, I've had canvases that have twist. I've had canvases that have gone out of square. And it happens. And... Dealing with that is tiresome and you need to take a great deal of care so that doesn't happen. But if you're doing it by hand, it often does happen. Um, but as I say, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, the company that did sold me most of the materials, stretchers and the linen, rolls of linen, um, went metric and I couldn't get the six foot and four foot stretchers anymore and they said would I consider ordering pre-stretched canvases and I thought is that really playing the game and I thought yes <laughs> yes that's that's what I want I want that effort gone and um, he said that because if, if I could have them pre-stretched he could order them in batches of four of any dimension I wanted so I could get the six foot by four foot even though they weren't making them for sale anymore Ooh. sorry sorry I'm trying to get in what you're working on oh me too I'm working on a tree um I got a question I think it's interesting from Philip Russell Lacey and he said do you ever work using your left hand and I remember hearing that naturally people are better at composition with their left hand, but you were left-handed. Uh, when I was at school, I used to write with my left hand, going to endless trouble about that, yes. Um, uh, when I was at the Royal College, I could write with my left hand, but not as fluently as with my right. I used to put on washes with both hands because that way um, if I used both hands I could keep the wash line wet all the time so there was not a moment when I had to pause while I reloaded the brush. So I've used both hands um, but I am unambiguously working in a right handed mode because I can see with my paintings if the picture has that movement as opposed to that movement. I, I switch them around and things like that. You know, sometimes I'll reverse them when, when they're printed. But I can always see, even from details, that I'm moving the choreography of the painting is right handed. Does that answer the question? Hmm. Okay. Okay, I've had a second person ask that we don't ask more questions. Okay. So, <laughs> so maybe you should crack on for a bit. Okay. <laughs> but I am making notes of everybody's questions. Well, here's the thing. I'm not going to work any slower if there's no questions. 
they could turn the I sound off. I think you off. do a bit. <laughs> I do. Girl. I mean, that's true. <laughs> Okay. If, if you don't want to hear Dad talk, you can turn the sound <laughs> off. All right. Oh, lots of people want to know about Avatar. Shall I ask a different question? <laughs> no, I don't mind answering questions about Avatar. Well, people just wanting to know, I guess, mostly what's going on with that. Well, what's How going on know? with it is nothing. Um, there was no question in my mind, and I don't think any question in uh, the, the, the mind of the production designer what they were doing was copying. Um, the, in an interview, he said that he'd studied my work and made references to it during the making of the film. And he ended up his interview by saying, well, floating islands, you know, where else do you get them? Um, it's, for me, it was a no brainer. And we did, um, attempt to get it into court um, because you know I, people do abuse artists work and just rip it off willy-nilly and I thought that was not on um, and it was interesting because there was a, a proposal to settle and um, the suggestion was if we came up with a sensible figure there would be a settlement um, and I thought my attorneys and we did come up with a sensible figure and the, the other side thought about it for a few months asked for an extension thought about it a few more months and then decided that they would go to court anyway so it, it didn't go to court. The, the um, trial judge stopped it and said, basically, he, um, what he did was complicated. He stated what we, copyright can be in different kinds of things. The simplest thing is that it's a, you paint something, draw something, make something, and somebody else copies it. And the test is would an ordinary person see a substantial similarity? So, in the case of my work, th that was, you know, we had, I don't know, something in the order of three million people saying it looked like a copy. And that was almost instantly, that was within a day or two of the film coming out. So, their defence wasn't that they didn't copy me, although they didn't admit that they did. Their defence was they only, if they copied, they only copied things that I myself had copied from nature. Well, here's the point about that. There were lots of things that I'd taken from nature, but I changed them. I changed them significantly. Um, the arches, I had three or four changes in mine. For example, mine were laminated. They were... Um, snapped off in many cases but we're leaving a lot of the arch remaining and it was um, yeah in, on most features that I had there were maybe ten, six, ten things that I did that weren't from nature and they managed to copy every single one of those features. But when the judge made his ruling, he took out most of my evidence. Because in the simple copyright case, you don't need to put in evidence. Just the work taken as a whole, does it look substantially the same to an ordinary person? And 
that was clearly going to be our argument because so many people had said they'd seen it. Um, but with the in the case of is it something I copied from nature, that's a different type of copyright and you are allowed to put in evidence for that. So when it came round to the fact that this was something what they were actually saying is that they only copied what I copied from nature, the judge had, judge had already taken out a lot of my evidence. And then he said he didn't see it, which to me, I don't know. Someone seemed... just commented that they saw a poster for Avatar in a shopping mall and thought it was a new Yes album coming out. <laughs> Lots of people said that to us and it helped a lot building everything. Just people's anecdotes of making that confusion. That yeah. was part of it as well, wasn't it, making your case? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, John Anderson said the only thing missing from Avatar was the yes music. Good <laughs> bless him. Uh, Valeria Hernandez wanted to know, I mean... I don't know if I should get off this topic, but I thought this was a nice question. Um, who inspired you when you were young? I was obsessed with almost anything but art. <laughs> I'm just going to get some other paint. There we go. Um, yeah. When I was a child, the thing that most excited me to draw was natural history. Animals, lizards, insects. And when I went to art school, I had some notion that I would end up designing the future and painting animals. Both things seemed to be things that would be what I'd love doing. Um, I said this last time, but I'll say it again just for the record that um, living between 12 and 14 in Hong Kong was f fabulous. I love that. And Chinese art and subsequently Japanese art, yeah, they were both influences. Someone just asked how your bonsai trees are doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to me... You must be me... honest. <laughs> Sorry? You must be honest. <laughs> I'm not going to be honest. <laughs> Too personal. Um, well, the first thing I did with... Um, the, well, I've got one surviving bonsai tree and we were looking at it just this weekend and thinking it looked a little troubled and I wasn't sure what the problem is. But I don't keep them as bonsai, so I don't crop the roots. I don't do any of that stuff. I just let them grow. And this is a mountain pine and we've had it maybe 30 years and it's yeah, it's um, I think it'll recover. Um, Tim Walton wants to know, what are your thoughts on Maxfield Parish? My thoughts on it? Mm. Ah, fantastic painting. Very interesting. Should I have a more elaborate <laughs> No, answer? no, there are just some humorous comments, sorry. <laughs> what? I'm not gonna uh, let's let's get a, I I'd need sorry Tim you'd have to write that again <laughs> it's disappeared um but yeah okay let me see what else I get um what about Bob Ross who Bob Ross I don't know you know he does those paintings of like mountains and pine trees on tv and he's got the beard and the curly hair Ooh. Did you ever watch him? I haven't. Oh. Is this something I should do? I don't know. I've never seen him. I've never seen no, him nor either. have I. Is this something that happens in England or just America? 
he's on TV in England now. I saw it the other day. Oh. I saw that it was on. I didn't watch it. I, well, I've not seen it, so sorry, I can't answer that. We'll give it a go. All right, I'll give it a go. <laughs> um, Sandy Re... Oh, sorry, carry on. I've never seen an artist, good, bad or indifferent or fantastic. Well, I haven't been able to learn something. You know, everybody has mastered something and it's always an interesting learning experience for me. I felt that when I was at the track conference last year. I thought, good God, there's a lot of very talented people here. And half of them I'd never heard of, and they were amazing. So that was lovely. That was an incredibly exciting time. Um, someone has asked, sorry, I, I didn't get your name before the question moved out, but someone's asked, do you draw and paint every day? I draw every day pretty much yeah um, it's yeah yeah I draw every day I don't paint anywhere near as much as I'd like to so your Facebook is exploding with people talking about Bob Ross now <laughs> well, I'm out of my debt, so we'll I'll, I'll just get on with this while you, you guys are talking. Um, oh, I just missed a question. It went up too quickly. Sorry, guys. Sometimes I miss them if there's a lot coming at the same time. Um, someone asked before, again, I missed who asked this, um, are the cats still collaborating with you in your paintings? The cats I've had, although seemingly magical, turn out to be incredibly earthbound. So 50 years on since um, Blitzen was the name of the cat that walked on pathways. He eventually died. People have asked if he died that day, but no, he went on to live quite a few more years. and interrupt quite a few paintings but um, no eventually he died um, I've learnt to my cost that if I feed the cats regularly they're less likely to walk paintings it's they know how to get my attention so they w walk where I'm working I can add another tree or two to this before it's finished but I'm gonna work on something else for the moment How do you get the foggy look on that? Is it painted or spray painted? Um, it's mostly painted. Yeah. I use the edge of the brush. Um, just someone just asked if I miss a question, can I scroll up? Um, no, not the way we're doing it on the phone now. I have tried doing that and then it, it just sort of makes everything go squirrely. But if you've got a particularly pressing question, if you just keep popping it in there and maybe it will pop in at a slow moment and I'll catch it. But I'm afraid it's a little bit ad hoc until we figure this out better. Um, but yeah, one question we had which I don't think you've ever we've ever talked about if you have is Martin Haynes wanted to know did you ever meet Darley no oh. I was um, I was with Richard Hamilton in Cadaquais once and he not me was invited to lunch with Darley but I did go with them he did invite me to tag along but somehow we got the dates and everything wrong. So we, um, I was going to show what paints I'm using. Do you want me to move the thing? No, I'll, I'll bring them over. I'll bring them over. Okay. Okay. When I'm intensifying the colours, 
I use the three primary colours. Actually, I use four because I use two versions of blue. This is simply primary yellow. It's transparent, so I can use it. That's the end of the simple names. Manganese blue hue. P-H-T-H-A-L-O, Thalo Blue, Green Shade. How about this one? Quinacridone, Magenta. All I need to remember is Magenta. And I know it's transparent. All these are transparent. So I can put them on like coloured glazes. And that's what I'm doing. I'm intensifying the colour here which will make that jump out and make that ease back. Okay. So basically, Ferrer's told me I've got to get all the colours on quick. So I'm going to start with a pale blue. This, uh, this, is, um, this is the manganese blue. And I quite like it. It's, it's pale, but it's, quite, it's still quite a strong blue. Debbie wants to know what your favourite Yes and Asia covers are. That's impossible really because they change. They change all the time. Um, I used to always say Relirium is my favourite Yes cover. And it's certainly up there, certainly one of my favourites. The problem is this, that... Um, Tales from Topographic Oceans, This One, Pathways, and Relay were all done in the early 70s or mid 70s. And they were very striking for the time. But I've learned to paint a lot more now. So whereas I still love them, uh, I still love even this, playing with them on, on, um, on the prints. Um, it's... Wait, hang on. It looks like the Wi-Fi cut out. Um, if you can see and hear us again, can you comment and let us know if everything's working okay? Sorry about that, guys. We thought we had this sorted. Is it working? Okay, I think it's working. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, carry on. One second. Whoops. I think Dad has gone to um, have words with the router. So I'm going to be here talking. <laughs> oh, God, he's back. <laughs> okay. Goodness. When I was at uh, school, and we used to walk on the cliffs in Dover. After a storm, you would see pyrites. And they would... Oh, it's got to be in the light there. You yeah. could see them in the cliff face and dig them out if there'd been a, a chalk fall. Some of them looked rusty if there was more iron. And some if there was more nickel and, believe it or not, actually trace amounts of gold. They would look like this. And they're beautiful. This is just a pebble, an ordinary pebble off the beach. And they're in my studio because at some point or another, I thought they looked beautiful and I kept them. Now, this is what I say to BT. Your little internet hub is about this size. But when it's not working, it is not beautiful. It serves no purpose. It just takes up air and it has a limited life. That's all I have to say on that matter. <laughs> So may we have the yes and Asia answer again while you're working on this. I'm going to give you a couple of extra minutes because we lost you a bit. OK, well, the yes answer was pretty much that this one, Tails and Relaya, are my favourites from the early days. And um, I, yeah, I, I, I loved all of them. For a lot of that time, though, Relaya probably was my favourite. Um, the Asia ones, I liked them as I did them. I liked um, I liked the dragon, then I liked Alpha, and then I liked 
Astra, I thought. I love working on all of them. I love the effect of them. And then in later years, Phoenix. Um, but I would say I was working on a, a, a close to the edge print just now. I like my painting, the painting I do now, more than the painting I did then. I think it's much better now. Um, I love what I did then, and it's very much of its day, but I love what I do now possibly even more. So it's a changing thing. It, it changes, well, it changes hour by hour, but it certainly changes week by week and month by month and year by year. Um, Doug Curran has asked, oh, sorry, have you finished? Yeah, go on, <laughs> Doug. Hello, um, Doug. Uh, are you working on a new book? Are you coming up with a new book? Yes, yes. Um, Freya and I have had sometimes awkward publishing conversations, but one of the things we were going to do in this lockdown is look at new books, and in particular, the sequel to Dragon's Garden. So the fourth one in the series. I've, <laughs> I've had it finished in my mind for about two years. And in two years, I've done a lot of work which I want to go into it. So it's, it's been growing. So I'm going to have to draw a line under it at some point quite soon, I guess. And get it out. Yeah. So Ferrer has been toying with the idea that we should start the publishing company going again. And I'm very keen to hand over as much effort as I can to it. <laughs> and help, of course. But, uh, yeah. And personally, if anyone fancies commenting which of the Paper Tiger and Dragon Stream books they like the best, or would love to see, you know, back again, that would be interesting from my point of view. But I'll ask, I'll ask Dad another question. How are you using those cups as palettes? How am I using them? Mm, someone asked. They saw you using the cup rather than a plate I want to know. oh well it's it's got a lot of liquid in it so I can make the paint as moist or as solid as I like this way if I used a palette I'd have to use it as semi-solid so this allows me to put transparent washes on that I couldn't do if I was using a palette and I don't know what they cost but they cost about a fiver for a hundred so they yeah, they're very cheap and it's, unfortunately, I do treat them as disposable. So I don't go out and try and scrub paint off plastic cups. But they serve purpose very well. Hmm. I did think, because I did get asked on the first day, would I, what did I think of painting in in oils and when I was doing those quick colour sketches it did occur to me that I could do that in oil so I before the end of this process once I've got the painting underway properly I might look at that sketching in oil process okay let's do one more minute um. Is there anything you'd like to say in your last minute? Well, I, yeah, we, we do get asked if um, where people can get these. And you can get them on the website. The, certainly the prints are all listed on the website. Uh, we are doing more affordable things there too. And if anyone wants an original, we can forward them to uh, people at Trading Boundaries. So, Should we have do a little close-up of what you're working on? Yeah. I'm Keep working in primary edge. colours into the shadow areas of this structure. And I'll probably work on it for a couple more hours before I decide it's finished. But it'll make that come forward and it'll allow these to gently retreat. Oh, t-shirts. Someone's asked about t-shirts a couple of times. Are we doing more t-shirts? 
Um, maybe. I, I don't know. It seems to me T-shirts come in all different sizes and um, it's easier to print them but to order. And we haven't got that nailed smoothly. We've tried a couple of companies. What's the company you tried for that we did the big plates with? Contrado. Yeah. We've tried T-shirts. Um, we've had some success with it. We've tried all kinds of things. Luggage ceramics oh we should show your luggage we'll do that next time <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll show you next time um i do get asked for t-shirts and i found it an awkward thing to do online but we might have to be braver and try harder thank you paul by the way you said i'm doing a good job <laughs> you are <laughs> your thank question you. top of the list next time <laughs> Okay, um, Freya tells me that I've taken up all of the time, all of your time that I'm allowed. Um, by next time, I'll have, I'll have the canvas, this one or that one, ready and started, and I'll be working on it direct. Even if the final design isn't totally crystallized, I'll be hammering that out actually on the canvas. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, everyone. Oh wait, we should say, as we always do, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 7pm GMT. Yes. So the next one we're going to be doing on Friday. Did you yes. say that already? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 7pm, not GMT, but English summertime. Oh. And hopefully you guys can make it. Thank you all.